All right, so my name is Casey Stella, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, streaming outlier analysis for fun and scalability. So, actually, do it this way. All right. So we're going to talk about streaming analytics in general. We're going to talk about a framework for doing outlier analysis that I think is somewhat novel. <clears throat> Maybe not novel, but interesting regardless. Um, I'm going to show you the demo that you saw me set up. And hopefully we'll have time for questions. Probably not, though, now. All right, so my name is Casey Stella. Uh, I'm an engineer at Hortonworks on the Apache Metron team. So Apache Metron is a cybersecurity product. Before that, I did, uh, I was a consultant. Actually, so I went around. I was a consulting data scientist. So I went around to a lot of companies and I saw a lot of the, the needs. And just like the previous speakers, I noticed that there was a lot of interest. There was a lot of interest and a lot of um, one, of the, one of the main use cases that I saw over and over was we have time series, we want to understand uh, anomalies. And those anomalies can come in the form of data quality issues, they could come in the form of Fraud, they can come in the form, they can come in many different forms. So the one motivating example I want to talk about is what really, really, really brought me to this was I was working in a healthcare organization, uh, a big insurance company in the US. And we recently transitioned to a new diagnostic coding scheme called ICD-10, which the world has been using for like ever. Um, but we, were trans we finally transitioned in the US, uh, a little bit of behind the times sometimes in healthcare. And, um, so we, we finally transitioned, but the insurance company wanted to under, understand uh, how the doctors associated with the um, with how the doctors associated with the insurance company were going to start coding. If they coded in a certain way, then the insurance company may lose money because sometimes doctors may code lazily, and the more specific the the, the disorder, the more the, the, that they that they um, diagnose people with and code up the more money they can get back from the government, right? So that's the, that, that was the motivating business case. So they said, we want to understand, so we have all of this data streaming in, all these doctors are diagnosing, um, and we want to look at three hour chunks or so, and we want to understand all of a sudden, are they coding very differently? Do they start coding very differently? And that sounded like an anomaly detection use case. And in particular, it sounded like a lot of anomaly, a lot of independent time series that need, needed to be analyzed in parallel, right? So talking generally, stepping back, talking generally about streaming analytics, um, I, I believe firmly that the future involves non-trivial analytics done on streaming data. Uh, you saw from the keynote, so I wrote this talk, I wrote this talk like a year ago, actually. Um, and it has become increasingly apparent going forward, and it was just the, the cherry on the top was listening to the keynotes yesterday where the vast majority of the discussion was around streaming. Non-trivial streaming analytics, data science done on streaming data is the future, I think. And it's not just IoT. So a lot of times when I talk, um, to people at Hortonworks and people in the big data space, when we t when I talk about streaming analytics, it's it's all it's almost always in the in the uh, it's always all it's almost always couched as an IoT issue, but it's it's not fraud, data quality, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of different use cases for this, and the need the there's a need for insights to keep pace with the velocity of the data. You don't want so I I, I definitely you know agree with um, Jan Stoika yesterday when he talked about needing to have decision-making systems where the decisions are made quickly. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that I agree entirely because I do think humans should be in the loop in a lot of these systems, but having the ability to have a machine curate and focus the direction of humans through dashboarding, through proper dashboarding, I think is extremely important. Okay, so there's a lot of good here. Much of the data can be, a lot of data can be coerced in a time series. <clears throat> but there's a lot of data and it's coming at you fast. The variety issue hits you more than you would expect, actually. It's a lot of different time series that have different meanings. <clears throat> Outlier analysis and anomaly detection, I believe, is a killer app. It's one of the killer analytic apps. 
The fact that we don't have a good outlier analysis package in Spark yet is, I think, testament to the fact that we are early on this path. Because I've seen this at so many places. <clears throat> outlier analysis can be computationally intensive. So if you, look at, if you look at some of the research papers and even the blog posts, you, you start seeing things like autoencoders and you start seeing things like robust PCA being discussed. Netflix did a really great blog a couple of years ago about how they're using robust PCA outlier analysis. <clears throat> and you heard this morning in the keynote from IBM, or I, I can't remember if it was from IBM, but someone mentioned autoencoders being the, the future of outlier detection. And I think that's probably true. But one thing I've noticed when streaming data is if you start putting a computationally intensive piece in the middle of your pipeline, stuff starts to break. <clears throat> and there's no, but the, there's no shortage of computational frameworks to handle streaming. So what I was trying to do, what I'm attempting to do here, is to do something that will work for most of the different streaming frameworks. All right. <clears throat> but there's not an overabundance of high quality outlier analysis frameworks. All right. Okay, so what is outlier analysis? Let's step even farther back. <clears throat> so outlier analysis or anomaly detection, it's a technique that where interesting points can be differentiated from normal points. So I'm speaking very broadly here because interesting for some may be defined as fraudulent. Interesting for others may be defined as anomalous because of data quality issues, right? <clears throat> so MacroBase is an outlier analysis system built for IoT by uh, MIT and MIT Stanford by a collaboration between MIT Stanford and uh, Cambridge Mobile Telematics. Um, it's a great paper. They actually released a paper about how they did it, and I think it's really interesting for anyone interested in outlier analysis. Um, this coupled with a recent paper by MIT um, about around uh, outlier analysis and cyber security. I think are two of the my, my top the last two years papers about outlier analysis. Um, but they, they, they noticed several properties of IoT data. Data produced by IoT applications often come from some ordinary distribution. This is simple statistics. It's not really super complicated, right? IoT anomalies are often systemic. So one will cause a systemic failure. So you'll see a lot of them suddenly. What you really want is the canary in the coal mine. And finally, they're often fairly rare, despite them being systemic, right? <clears throat> so ha finding a way to reduce false positives is important. So what I'm proposing is a hybrid approach to this. So realizing that most modern outlier analysis detection uh, approaches either require a lot of intense pre-training or are computationally intensive if they're, if they're unsupervised, um, I'm suggesting that we take a two-phase approach here. <clears throat> so for every data point, I believe you should, so what I've constructed is the ability to detect the outlier candidate using a robust estimator that uses distributional sketching. So distributional sketching being pro a probabilistic technique. So what you need to do to do simple one-dimensional outlier analysis through really simple techniques with statistics is get things like medians. Medians are relatively hard to get in, in, in terms of, in, in the sense that averages form a semi-group, right? Medians don't. Finding the middle point of something require, you, it's, it's not an updatable, mergeable thing. But if you're using, if you use um, probabilistic structures that give you kind of an estimate or a sketch of the distribution, you can, you can do fairly well. And you can even generalize because most, you can do arbitrary dimensions that way. So Q trees are one solution to that. Um, a library called Algebra has those. Um, Ted Dunning has a really excellent library out there called um, <clears throat> T trees, or sorry, T digests, which is a sort of a generalization hardening of the Q tree approach. But the point is, you want a structure that you can merge, right? Just like in, just like in the batch case, it's important to be able to merge. If you can think of it in terms of maps and reduces, you need to be able to reduce this. And you want to gather a bias sample. So 
you're going to sketch, you're going to figure out the, the first phase, whether or not it's an outlier based on some probabilistic techniques, right? That's not 100%, but you're just going to take those, those examples or those candidates and you're going to pass it to the next phase, which is, so for every outlier candidate, you use a more traditional or more computationally intense approach. So you can think of this as not so much a suggestion of, of an algorithm, though we'll talk about that in the next slides, but more of a suggestion of an approach. Use something cheap to get the candidates and then use your more computationally intensive approach on a sample that you've gathered through the, uh, <clears throat> across the data stream. And make sure that the approach can, can save its state off and can be merged. Because a lot of times what you want are, is this an outlier based on the last 15 minutes? Well, that's fairly easy in most streaming applications. Or is it an outlier based on the last three months of data? Well, that can be a lot more difficult, right? That's where the determinism in space comes in. It's very important. But this is, of course, expensive computationally, but it's run infrequently. So it's a bit more, um, <clears throat> It, be it becomes possible to use a, a broader range of, of approaches. So what this becomes is a data filter, which can be attached. It's actually two data filters. The first data filter is filtering your regular data into candidates, and the second data filter is filtering those candidates into actual proper outliers. And it becomes a filter that can be attached to, time series, to a time series data stream in most distributed com computational frameworks that handle streaming like Storm, like Spark, like Flink, and even simple ones like NiFi <clears throat> to detect outliers. So hose of data comes in, trickle of outliers come out is the idea. Okay, so what do I mean by sketching? What do I mean by probabilistic data structures? So we're gonna talk about one particular algorithm that, that we'll be able to use them. So now that I have, now that I'm able to get robot, uh, now that I'm able to get statistics like medians and arbitrary um, <coughs> distributional statistics, I can, I'm open to being able to use probably as my favorite simple one dimensional outlier detection, what I go to and have used a number of times, which is median absolute deviation. So what median absolute deviation is, it's a robust statistic. Um, <clears throat> so it's uh, not sensitive to the presence of outliers. Uh, it's more robust than using simple standard deviation. Um, but the idea is that you're capturing the, the deviations from each of the data points from the median, and you're looking at how far away, you're, and you're using that to construct a z-score, essentially. So, the upshot here is that it's a formal way to encode your intuition, which is if a point is far away from the kind of the central point of our window, then it's likely to be an outlier. But the important point here is the, win the notion of a window. The notion of a window, because we're using, because we're able to capture distributional sketches, and those distributional sketches are constant in space in, in terms of memory used, and can be saved off to places like HBase and to persistent storage and then merge together, we can actually store the, that window context, the context of the distribution for a month back or a year back, or we can change, we can change that window as the, as the data flows through without bringing down your streaming framework. That's the, that's the important key here, is that you're capturing this data, but you can slice and dice it however you want it doesn't have, to, this, that's not a design time problem anymore, that's a runtime problem. If you decide that this, would, this doesn't work well with an hour's worth of data, but instead it works better with a day's worth of data back, in terms of medians, you can do that. That's the point. Because those are small objects stored in persistent storage and can be pulled out. Okay, I think I've hammered that point home enough. <clears throat> so the architecture here, just in general, so this looks the exact same for most of the streaming frameworks because you're really talking about a simple filter here is that your data is coming in with you, where in our case particularly we have a lot of different time series data sets, each of them defined by a group. 
<coughs> we want to group that by the by the actual group so that we get a stream so that we get many different time series streams and through there we're going to save off the time series to open tsdb which is a time series database backed by hbase and we're going to filter that <coughs> through our outlier analysis and we're going to push the outliers to Elasticsearch. And this is just an example architecture. <clears throat> and then we're going to mash up OpenTSDB, which has all of our raw points inside of HBase. And we're going to mash it up with Elasticsearch, which just has our outliers, which is a relatively small data. And we're going to mash it up through Grafana. And we're going to create dashboards that allow humans to make decisions on outliers. All right. So <clears throat> I wrote this talk before I started Metron, but before I started working on Metron, which is a cybersecurity application. But it really informed a lot of the, the thinking that I had when I came into it, because it turns out cybersecurity is a lot of outlier analysis too, right? Um, and it's the same kind of idea. <clears throat> so we really have a couple of characteristics that are kind of interesting. Um, it's aimed primarily at low to medium velocity time series, but a lot of them all at once, right? <clears throat> Just like our example of um, with the doctors. There's many different doctors, each diagnosing. You want to group them maybe by specialty, but not beyond that, right? But you really only want to group them, you really want to only want to consider how a doctor does, how a doctor diagnose, diagnoses and prescribes based on his history? Is he doing something shocking compared to himself? It may be compared to his specialty at, at large, right? So a lot of different time series. And it's aimed ma mainly right now at one-dimensional data streams instead of outliers across multi-dimensional data streams. I'd like to expand this out to that. Um, that's next steps as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> And because probabilistic sketches are extremely compact, you can look much farther back in your context and you can do that, you can make that decision much later on because they're mergeable. It's the nice part about, um, <clears throat> the nice part about using mergeable data structures. M much farther back than a na naive windowing solution where you're just hard coding a 15 minute window. And you send the outliers that are low velocity now <clears throat> and the raw time series to TSDB to handle the scaling and the outliers to Elasticsearch. And that way you can investigate the data after the fact as it, and marry the two into a single pane of glass. So I'm going to save enough time so that I can uh, do a demo for you. And you can't see that at all. How's that? Okay, so in the U.S., we have what's called the Sunshine Laws. And the Sunshine Laws mean that um, it, it, it mandates transparency um, of, <clears throat> of data in a lot, for, a lot of mid, for a lot of different dimensions. One of the open data sets that came through as part of the, trans, in, as part of the Sunshine Laws was a data set that, is, that um, connects physicians and the companies that interact with physicians uh, by giving them payments outside of, outside of normal business payments, like gifts, travel, things like that. So they made it open, and they made it open for us all to look at so we can find outliers, we can, we can find fraud, possibly, right? Almost no one has looked at this data set from what I can tell. I think there's exactly one Wall Street Journal article when it first came out uh, and that was two years ago, that, that touches on it briefly. They contacted one person and he said, that was a mistake, it was mischaracterized. So they found bad data. So this actually fits very well within this paradigm. What I wanna be able to do is look at outliers based on, but I, want, I, I don't wanna look at your outlier based on um, across all doctors right, across all payments at least. What I wanna do is I want to group things by the reason, so gifts are gonna have a different distribution than travel and expenses, right, different values. 
<clears throat> and I also want to compare you against your special, other doctors from your specialty. Because maybe neurosurgeons get payments or gifts differently than um, <clears throat> dentists, per se. All right? Okay. So that's what we've created here as a dashboard. We ran, through the, we ran this data through the system, relatively small data, a lot of different time series. And here at the top, we have a, da we have a, a, a dashboard that talks exactly about what are the outliers across all different specialties for this reason. So you can see I'm looking at gifts and travel and lodging across all the different specialties. So you can see that gifts are overrepresented by dentists. I thought that was interesting. I haven't seen any news articles about that, but it certainly is the truth. <clears throat> and this is ordered by the z-score that we were talking about before. How much of an outlier is this? A normal z-score is somewhere around 3.5. This is around 21, right? This is our, at our worst. So let's drill into this guy. That's where our physician is coming from. So let's look at him compared to his peers. And you will see on green here, pulling from TSDB, is our raw data. In yellow here is our outliers that we, that we chose as outliers. You can see it did a pretty good job, I think. Those are pretty big outliers. So let's go down and look at them. So look at the details here for just the outliers. And you can see most of them have a reason. Transaction for exchange, return order. Now why is that a gift, I would argue. So what we found here is bad data, poorly represented data. That shouldn't be a gift as far as I'm concerned. Right? And that's some of the things you're going to get. <clears throat> Other ones are going to be reasonable. Some sort of implant system that was given with no charge. Though I would argue, why is the dental supply company